about today is uh, give you a brief, hopefully brief, overview of some research that was funded by the Cultural Center in Oman, uh, specifically looking at uh, vegetation dynamics and uh, impact of grazing in the Dufar Mountains uh, near Samoa. And this is work that was done, it was actually initially uh, inspired by a report that Andrew Spalton of the, the uh, Kuwana World Court in Oman had done uh, urging a study of, of the impact on, on vegetation, <clears throat> it being endemic vegetation in the bottom. And so we took some of the tools that, uh, some of the satellite-based tools that we use that are developed in other parts of the world and try to apply them in Iran to try and understand what is the impact of, of grazing in the mountains. And so um, I'll start out saying a little bit about uh, the bar and the, the landscape there uh, and uh, show you some of the, the on the ground observations that we made of the, the direct impact of, of cattle and camel and to some degree goat grazing. And then I'll show you some of the analysis, the results of the analysis that we did using different types of satellites, trying to map the change in different satellites. And, um, uh, and then I will end with a uh, much more detailed view from a, a different, a newer type of satellite. And uh, even though the, the title may imply bad news, I think the, the end result is good news for so, uh, I'm going to try to not, I'll, I'll try to be as non technical as possible. If I say anything, if I slip up in jargon uh, and you don't understand what I, what I said, please stop me and ask me to explain it because if you don't understand, I probably nobody else does either. So, what you're looking at here is a, um, an elevation map of the southwest corner of the Arabian Peninsula where it's being uh, ripped out of the African continent. And so the, uh, the sea floor spreading that's been going on for the past several million years in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden is a result of the Arabian Peninsula, Arabian plates movement to the north and east. And so when you, when you rip a continent apart, or when a continent gets ripped apart, uh, a lot of things happen. It's, it's dramatic. Uh, the process of ripping causes hot mantle from deeper in the earth to come up. It causes a lot of melting, causes a lot of volcanism. It also uh, causes the area that's being stretched to thin and, and um, swell, or thin and, and rise as it gets, as it's, it gets hotter. And so on the edges of, of rifts, you can see very typically what you see here on the, the southern corner of the Arabian Peninsula. There's nowhere else to do this. You see these uplift and bridge plains. These are very common. You see the same thing um, between uh, parts of West Africa and Brazil where they ripped apart. And so the, the terrain in Dofar where we're looking is the easternmost extent of that, that rift impact of the, the, uh, the uplift from the ripping is, is Arabia's being and so we'll be looking in the Dofar Mountains, specifically this area right here. And a little closer view. This, for those who are familiar with the, the geography of Oman, this is the area right around Samala. And if you know about the geography of Oman and Samala in particular, you probably know that it's famous for the uh, the, Kari, the, the uh, monsoon. The terrain here catches a little bit of the southwest monsoon and causes the, the uplifted terrain, causes the moist air to move up, and as it moves up, it rains. And so you get, um, in an otherwise very dry place, you get this very localized, persistent uh, mist and rain that occurs in the, in the summer every year. And so uh, what we refer, what are referred to as the, the far mountains are these this area here, which it's not a typical mountain range because it's really kind of a ramp. It's uplifted on one edge and then 
drops off very, very gradually as you go up into the Medici and the, uh, the Rubicon of the north. But because the escarpment is so steep, the moist air goes up rather quickly, and so when that happens, the, the, more, the water vapor in the air precipitates out in the form of rain. And so the effect is what you see here. These are satellite images that I'll explain in more detail in just a moment. Um, this is what the area looks like uh, before the monsoon starts, before the Karib starts. And this is what it looks like. This image in the center is what it looks like for about two months, two to three months every year, as the, the moist air forms clouds that just hang over top of the, the range. And or the two ranges, really, the, the uh, Jabal al Kara and Jabal al Kamar here. And you can see what the result is in usually September when the, the clouds clear. The result is that the mountains are completely uh, covered with very lush vegetation. There's a couple of photographs here uh, from Andrew Spalding, who's been working in this area for quite, quite some time. Uh, and <laughs> you can see it's very lush, it's very shocking. And um, not long after that, though, the clouds clear and the water starts evaporating and plants start transpiring in the water and basically the area starts to dry out. And so it doesn't stay here for very long. It's very green and then it desiccates really quickly in the next two great years. So what I'm going to show you now are a series of other photographs, field photographs from these different ranges to show you some of the range of landscapes that have here. Uh, we'll start in the, the, the uh, east, the Jabal Sampan. This is uh, as we drove in from, from Moscow. Uh, so we'll go from, from uh, east to west. And these, the photos that I'm going to show you were not taken during the Korea. They were taken uh, uh, in sort of the January, March window when we were there. So this is what the top of the sun kind of looks like as you're coming in from the east. And on this day, this particular day, there was a, a cloud deck set up. And so we were, we're basically above the clouds here. And this is what it looks like after the clouds clear when you're down on the coast, looking back up at it. So what you're seeing here is the, this uplifted rift flank that used to be part of Africa. And that's about 1,200 meters from And this is what it looks like up on top as you start to go westward from the Jebel Sampan down into the Jebel Kara. Kara. And so you can see it again over on the coast in the distance there's a lot of cloud, but here we're back down to the point where the clouds come. And so what we have here is kind of an uh, open woodland savanna kind of environment with seasonal grasses and trees that are somewhat green over there. And as we go a little further east of the Jabal al Kara, this is the largest of the Wadi, largest and deepest of the Wadi systems. The Jabal al Kara has much more subdued terrain than the Jabal Sampan does, but the, uh, this, this big Wadi system we're looking at here is the, the most deeply incised and steepest. And so what you can see on the sides of the Wadis here is a, a forest. And then you, know, you can't really see it here, but there's a but you can see that the forest thins out as you start to get up into the more, more general slopes up on the top side. Is there any more technical views from other Oh, sorry, canyon. Canyon. Um, yeah, so it's canyon, the, the network of canyons that you'll see in more detail in just a moment. And so a, a more typical terrain is, is shown here. Uh, this is my graduate student, Dan Souza, taking a photograph looking from the top of the Jabal al Kara down onto the, the Sabala plain. So that's the part of the city of Sabala there on the coast. And so this more gentle foothill kind of terrain is just right there. And again, you can see it's a combination of this time of year, not much grass left, but uh, these trees and kind of not, not quite forest. And green. And here's Andrew Spalton taking a photograph uh, on a little bit steeper 
uh, edge of a, of a canyon. And you can see it's a bit more densely um, forested here. But what you can see on top are, is a transition to the, uh, to the range top grasslands. With many fewer trees and, and much less topography. And this is a more typical of a, a smaller upland head of a, of a smaller body system. So this is all forest down here, and this is the transition to the range top grasslands there. And these plants here, the green ones, are known as Sodom's apple. I don't remember the Latin name, but they're generally considered a, an indicator of overgrazing and, and degraded landscapes. They, they're found all over the world where there's overgrazing. So and so now going further to the east into the, the jungle of Kamara, uh, it's a much narrower mountain range with much steeper, much more extreme terrain topography. This is about halfway up to the range top, looking back to the east towards Slava. Slava is just a little beyond the edge of the, of the photograph here. And this is looking upward from there, and so you can see it, it continues up steeply until you get to the top of here. And once you're up top, it, it flattens out again. You have this, this uh, these range top grasslands that occur up there. And again, the sides have a very degree, very density of forest. And here's another shot from our and here's an example of a transition from a full dense forest to a pretty open grassland. And here we meet the characters, actors on stage, and it's a small group of barring cattle working away trying to get something to eat. Close up. Um, they're not the friendliest cattle. Like my grandfather was a cattle rancher. Spend some time on the cattle, and the, the cattle in the bar are not. <laughs> I don't think they're used to having people wandering around in their, their territory. And so you can see this was this was taken in February of 2016, and you can see the grass is pretty much parched, but they it still has some nutritional value. They still graze on it. These green plants here are plants that no animal will eat. They have oh, I forget the name of the, the name of the plant, but they have something in the leaves that. No, no grazing animal will touch. So those plants eat them. And here are the other, the other characters. Uh, it's a mob of camels next to an explosion. I'll explain the explosions later. The explosions were uh, a totally unexpected, very fortunate accident that we came across that took us out. Of the park on that. And so you may notice on the side where the camels are, there's about a bit of biomass to be had, and right on the other side of the fence, there's plenty of it, and that's why the camels are at the edge of the fence. The camels are hungry. Apparently, the, neither the camels nor the cattle get enough, enough to eat, enough nutrition later in the year. At this point in the year, when most of the grass has been senesced or eaten, they have to be fed food supplements. And so they go out and they pretend like they're grazing all day long, and then they come back home at night and get fed stick as far as the cow equivalent stick as far. Okay, the wrong direction. Okay, and then there's a <clears throat> none of these are not wild camels. When I first saw the photos, I thought they might be wild. Apparently there's not one wild camel in Oman. They're all owned by somebody. And here's the one of the tenders taking them out to kill a tree. <laughs> Actually they, 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 they're almost at the limit of what they can get from a lot of the trees, bigger trees like this, have enough out of reach of the camel. They do okay. It's the, the trees in the Anagasis forest and the canyons are, are not as tall and they're, they're more vulnerable to, to camel feet. Yeah. And then there are goats involved as well. And goats, goat kids, they, they, they can climb, they can fly. <laughs> Most often, goats. And they're everywhere, they're on the roads, they're in parking lots, they're all over the place. And so here you can see some cattle grazing on hill slope. And you can see that they're kind of making these, these little, almost like a, a terrace effect. And this is a very easy way to tell when you have a lot of cattle because they walk along the sand trails 
And so you can see this entire valley, you know, this entire canyon network here has been, been grazed down the ground. And you notice also around the bushes in some places where the grazing pressure is really heavy, you see these halos of brighter, uh, brighter soil, exposed soil, where all the, the every last bit of, of biomass has been scraped away. I think that's from the, them standing there and eating, trying to eat the bush, and it's their, their feet that are grinding the soil away there and making it bright. But yeah, in areas where you see that, you know, they're, they're some really hungry, hungry animals. If the um, biomass would, so if that would sort of degrade the biomass on, on the flat land, do you get the study that you've done slopes? No, in terms of biomass, there wouldn't be because the, the slopes have, have full on forest. And so the, the trees are, are more densely packed, they're closer together, mm -hmm. and there's more of what's called understory underneath the trees when, when, it's, when it's green. And so there's absolutely more biomass on the slopes. But right after the grief, when the you know, when everything's green, there's you know, the, the, the range tops look like a you know, like a fall grass meadow that you can see in this. There's a considerable amount, but it, it's hard to beat trees for biomass. They, And so these are all examples of you know things that we can see in the field where we can document you know this is an area that's heavily grazed you get an idea how heavily grazed it is by how much of these impacts you see this is an interesting area this is on the uh, one of the, the high cliffs between the Jabal Kumar and Jabal Kara just just to the west of, of Salala and this is what's called a stack and this is a big column of rock that's separated from the cliff. And according to my GPS, the altitude up here is 224 meters down to sea level. And so this thing somehow separated, but there is, as you can see, there's grass growing over here, and the grass on this, on this side, they're eaten right down, down to the dirt. On this side, you've got covered in waist high. The grass is senesced, but it's still there. And so, um, because no animals can get there. So that's a, an indication of what this whole area would look like if it wasn't grazing. Okay, so that's what the landscape looks like. Now, a little bit of science. So we're using, we use satellites to try and map the, the to try and quantify rigorously the way that the land, land surface is changing. And uh, effectively what we want, what we like do we stop for a second? Uh, what we like to do is basically make a series of vegetation maps. At the very least, we'd like to see where there's vegetation, how much vegetation there is, how dense the vegetation is in different parts of the landscape. What we'd really like to be able to see is what type of vegetation it is. And, and not just trees versus grass, but, but one of the holy grails is to be able to map different species of trees or different species of agriculture. And uh, we're not quite there yet, but but we do have um, we do have a lot of experience. We, the, the community of people who use this kind of urban sensing, has a, a lot of experience mapping vegetation. And uh, for a reason, I'll explain in just one second. So the instruments we use are basically just like digital cameras, very sophisticated digital cameras, onboard satellites, and whatnot. The main difference. Uh, is that a normal digital camera images three colors. It images red, green, and blue brightness, and then it, it sandwiches those three primary color brightness images together to make an image that looks like what our eyes can have. The instruments that we use also image in the infrared beyond the range of where our eyes are sensitive. And what we really like to measure is quantity called the reflectance. And reflectance is a physical quantity, it's a physical characteristic of everything that reflects light that determines what we perceive as color. And so our eyes are actually a very complicated, our eye brain system is a very complicated sensor. These, these electronic sensors are much simpler. And so we take an instrument into the field with us called a, a handheld spectrometer. 
it measures the reflectance, it measures the fraction of sunlight that's reflected off the surface of whatever you pointed at. At very narrow wavelength intervals over both the visible part of the spectrum and the infrared. And that's what these thick continuous curves that you see here are. These are reflectance curves that we measure in the field. And uh, for instance, we'll start with a simple one. This is this blue curve here is a cloud. And clouds, we see clouds as white because they reflect visible colors in about equal proportions. And hence, that's why you see this curve is fairly flat, reflecting <coughs> all the visible and, and the near infrared wavelengths equally. Just as a point of reference, uh, the wavelength units here are micrometers, so they're millionths of a meter, very short wavelengths. The visible part of the spectrum that our eyes are sensitive to goes between 0.4 and 0.7 meters. Blue is around 0.4, red is at 0.7, and beyond 0.7 is near infrared. And um, so you can see that clouds are white, both in the visible and the infrared. Soil, this is why soil appears shaded with brown, because it's less reflective in the blue and it's more reflective in the red. And it looks more like brown in our eyes. It's even more reflective in the near infrared. Non photosynthetic vegetation is basically like dry, dead grass, branches, dead leaves, things like that. And it starts to look more like soil. The longer it sits there, it eventually it becomes soil. And finally, last but not least, this is what live healthy vegetation looks like. It's really absorptive in the visible blue and the visible red, a little bit less in the visible green. And the reason for that is because it has two types of chlorophyll that absorb, absorb energy at those wavelengths and use it to, to power the, the plant's photosynthesis process. And so we see plants as green because they're just a little bit less absorptive Invisible green than they are in red and blue. But the main thing is they're really absorptive. Vegetation is dark in the visible. But what happens is as soon as you get to the wavelength where our eyes cut out, it becomes really, really bright. And this is called a red edge. It's where it goes from being very absorptive to very reflective. And this is this is what distinguishes live healthy vegetation from everything else. Nothing else has this feature, this, this characteristic shape. So the shapes of these curves are kind of like the fingerprints that we try and use to distinguish one type of plant from another. Now what you see superimposed here, these dashed curves are showing the range of wavelengths where the satellite sensor is, is making its measurements. Uh, we don't yet have satellite sensors that can, well, it's not exactly true. Uh, <clears throat> The satellite sensors we have access to can't measure these continuous curves yet, although we're probably three years away from having that. The ones that we use are more like digital cameras in that they just measure uh, a specific range of wavelengths. And so what you're looking at here are the sensitivity ranges of the MODIS sensor. That's what reflected this image here in the one from the previous slide. And so instead of getting this nice continuous curve with all this detail in it, we just get discrete measurements of these points. And so we have to infer from that. So the thing to notice here, the thing that we're using, that we'll be using in the rest of the talk, is um, uh, we use a measure of the slope between the visible red and near infrared. Because notice that nothing has a steepest slope between this point and this point as the vegetation. So we have an index that's basically the difference between those, those two reflectances. And so the greater the slope, the more likely that the material is vegetation. And you notice the vegetation has the greatest slope. The dead vegetation, the non-photosynthetic vegetation has a much lower slope. Soil has a lower slope still. These are the example values here. And then the cloud has basically no slope. And so we're going to use the spectral slope to map what's on the ground. So here's a map. It's actually this is the, the average of that, that index value over the course of the whole year of the area. And what you can see is it really effectively identifies the vegetated areas of mountain ranges in the coastal plain. The brighter the green up to white, the denser the vegetation is. The 
And so, and these are just some field photos showing the contrast of what it's looking at. And so, it's a, especially in a, a arid environment like this, where you tend to either have a lot of vegetation or very little or none at all, it's a really, really effective tool. And so, the MODIS sensor, the MODIS satellite that we're using, images almost every place on Earth, almost every day. And so, what we get when we take this index, and make for every every day we have an observation, an image, we make a vegetation map out of this. And so what we end up with is a big stack of these vegetation maps. You can turn it into a movie. Yeah, yeah. You, in fact, you could animate this. I thought about doing that, but I figured that's just asking for trouble. Nice. <laughs> Tempting fate. But you can see in this kind of cutaway view, this is this is the area that in that red box there. So it's, it's designed to slice through some different types of environment. These are the farms uh, down in the Slava Plain. And you can see the areas, well you can see first of all in time, this is the calendar year. And so for most of the year it's fairly dark gray, it's not, not a lot of vegetation. Then it's black because it's completely covered with clouds during the Kuri, during the monsoon. And then here you can see when the clouds clear, Everything is green, right? The lighter the, the lighter the shade of gray here, the, the more vegetation there is. And so everything is it's like those photos that I showed you, the Andrews photos that I showed you very beginning. Everything's super green. But then you see what happens is the areas where it's cutting through forest and the canyons stays green throughout the year. And the areas where it's on the grassland, it drops off very quickly. And so if you take one pixel, for instance, this pixel right here in that blue spot, and you look at just the time series of this index value, vegetation index value over the course of the year, it starts out fairly low and it's getting, you know, it's dropping a little bit through the calendar year, and then, then the monsoon starts and clouds go over. And so then it's nothing, right? Just remember the cloud, cloud values are flat. And so you don't see, it just sees the top of the clouds, and then all of a sudden, quickly, the clouds clear out, and the greenness has gone way up because there's low precipitation. But because grass doesn't have deep roots and uh, transpires water very quickly, grass doesn't last very long without water. Probably up to this is here in the summer, kind of drought, right? It's like you can almost watch the grass, your, your lawn getting darker. Whereas the trees can hang out longer because they have tap roots, they go deeper in the soil where they hold water. And so, the greenness of the of the range top grasslands drops off really quickly after the clouds clear, whereas the, the forest greenness drops off much more slowly over the course of the whole year. And so we can use the temporal signature in addition to the spectral signature to distinguish different types of vegetation and to distinguish how they're responding because different parts of the range get different amounts of precipitation depending on how the how the clouds set. And so Different years, different parts of the range ranges have different progressions, different evolutions after the clouds clear, and so that can tell us. We can use the vegetation to tell us something about how much precipitation was happening in and under the clouds when we couldn't see what was happening. So, uh, if you're not used to looking at plots like this, or if you just don't like plots like this, just ignore it. Don't be overstimulated. Uh, but this this is. For, for those who, for those who uh, absolutely must know all the details, here they are. What you're looking at here on the right column first is a gray, gray shaded image. This is what we call a calendar plot. And it goes through the course of the year from January through December, left to right, horizontally. And you go by year from 2000 to 2016 from top to bottom. So what you see here, every day of those 16 years, the shade of the gray indicates how green a particular area was. Okay, these are, actually these are averages over a, over a patch of, of pixels. And so the top row here are range tops in the western part of Jump Up, Mount Kara. And what you can see here, for each year you can see, kind of like the previous slide, fairly dark gray, low vegetation, then black as the clouds come in, then the clouds clear out and it's white, 
and then the white fades back to gray. Okay. And so for three different, the east, central, and west range tops, we see somewhat different patterns depending on how long the clouds were hanging over one part of the range or another, and how much water precipitated out of the soil. And so we wanted to see if there's any trend. Is this, is this area getting progressively drier? Is it being deforested? Is anything happening progressively here? Yes? The third row down, it looks like an outlier of what's happened there in each of, in each of the squares. Uh, third row, which one? Where? In each of them, the third row down. Oh, oh, here. Yep. Yeah, okay, a couple of the years, there was a problem with satellite where every, like, every third image or so was just noisy. We don't know why, we weren't able to fix it. In a lot of the measurements, we excluded those, those years. There were three years where this happened. And yeah, you're right, very, very sharp on it. That was one, you, you can see the other two here as well. Um, yeah, so those are outliers, we didn't include those. But so what we want to see is, is there a progressive change, right? On a certain day of the year, is the area, is the, veget the vegetation decreasing on that day of the year because, you know, from one year to the next. And so the way we did that was we took a vertical column through here on, we took three particular Julian dates, three days of, of each year. And then for each of the 16 years, we took that average amount of vegetation and looked at how the average vegetation within each of these parts of the range tops changed over those 16 years. And so if there was something progressive happening, you'd see, you'd expect to see that the points either increasing or decreasing or something. And what you can see here clearly is that the, the variability from year to year in all of these areas, variability from year to year completely swamps any, any trend that might be present. And if, if you don't trust your eyes, Trust statistics more than you trust your eyes. We have the regression statistics here on top. The S value is the slope, the estimated slope, and the P value is the, the confidence value. And basically, the only, the only, uh, only of these cases where the estimate was statistically significant were the ones that had basically zero slope. And you can see why, right? I mean, there's it's hard to convince some that. I find it hard to convince myself that there's any real pattern in any of these. Except that the, the year to year variability is so great that it masks any, any trend that might be present. So that's the story with the range tops. Here's the same thing for different sets of the wadis in, in both mountain ranges. Same situation with the, the forests and the canyons. The year to year variability is so great that it masks any any progressive trend that might be there. So, you know, if you're expecting to hear that, you know, the far is being deforested and that there's going to be no forest left in five years and the camels are going to take over, we don't see any evidence for that in these days. Now, there's a limitation though, is this sensor, the MODIS sensor, the reason that we can have coverage almost every day is it's a pixel system. And so it covers a very wide area, but the price you pay is you don't get a lot of spatial detail. And so we get a lot of temporal detail, but not spatial. So to complement that, we look at another series of satellites called the Landsat series. Landsat only revisits every place on Earth every 16 days, once every 16 days, as opposed to almost every day. But pixels are not 250 by 250 meters like MODIS, they're 30 by 30 meters. And so we can see much finer scale features on the landscape with Landsat. And so what you're looking at here on the left is, is basically the equivalent of a, an infrared photograph from Landsat. Again, the green, the brighter the green, the denser the vegetation. And you're looking at a, a bit of the central Jabal Kampara here. The canyons, the forested canyons are the bright green areas here. This is in, I think, October, Julian Day 85, 2015. And so it's, it's not right after the monsoon when everything is green. We wanted to look a little bit later when the, the difference from year to year becomes more apparent. And so you can see the range tops are starting to turn brown. 
And then out here in the dead edge, it's, it's that light color from the bone snow vegetation. And then down here on the, on the Salava Plain, you can see variations as well. And so the brown areas are areas that were probably covered with grass in September and have since started to nest. And the green areas are still fully leafed out forest. So we use a process kind of like what I explained earlier to estimate how much within each 30 by 30 meter mm -hmm. pixel, how much, how much of that pixel is vegetation, how much is soil, and how much is shadow. And that tells us something about the, the composition of each pixel. And so in these maps that you're about to see, the red channel in the image corresponds to the soil, the green corresponds to the vegetation, and the blue corresponds to the shadow. So up here, it's almost all exposed soil, uh, almost no vegetation. Here, it's darker, so it's like this purple shade. And that's because there's more dead senesce vegetation up in here. It makes it darker and also casts some shadows. And then, of course, in the canyons, it's bright green. And so the difference between this and this is this gives us, this allows us to use a, a unit that's easy to understand, just how much of the area of the pixel is covered with each of these different, different materials, or materials that can show. So this is what it looked like in 2015. Now compare that to 2016. Now the satellite is very well intercalibrated, so we can compare quantitatively one year to the next. And you can see the difference. 2016, the 2016 Karif was, was much stronger. It brought a lot more precipitation in. Uh, the, 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 um, the Jabalis, the Dakaris who lived there also told us this when we were out in the field talking to them. So the Karif back here was much better than the one year before. And so the satellite sees everything in green. So what we're going to do now, I'll just show you a couple of comparison of those two years, again, from this Landsat satellite, higher spatial resolution. And I'll show you some time series of greenness, vegetation, for different types of environments. So we have a, a, a foothill on the coastal side of the range. We have a, a canyon on the coastal side of the range. We have a, a, Range top grassland on the coastal side. We have a canyon back further toward the desert. We have a range top further toward the desert. And then we have an example here on the very edge of where you go into the edge. And so in each case, the 2016 greenness is in green, 2015 in red. And so, for instance, the uh, range tops, both inland and coastal, are much greener in 2016 than 2015. Both of them drop off. The greenness drops off really quickly in both cases. But it stays greener in 2016 with more precipitation, more moisture in the soil, and presumably more denser grasses and vegetation. The forests and the canyons, different story. They do, again, 2016 does start out as green or in some of the hills greener. And it drops off a bit in the beginning, and then it just goes more slowly. And even in dry year, the same thing happens, but there's noticeably more vegetation, certainly due to more moisture in the soil in 2016. And then once you get in back toward the desert side of the range, it never gets as much precipitation. And then, so it's never very green. And on the coastal side, the range from the coastal side, we have the, the forest of 2016 just goes really slowly. 2015 drops off much faster. And so this is another illustration of the effect of the of one year's precipitation compared to another zone of vegetation throughout the whole rest of the year. And finally, the, the last thing I want to show you here are um, the effects of some uh, what are called disclosures. So they're basically fenced in areas that the Ministry of, of Agriculture and the Ministry of Environment build and to varying degrees maintain. And so they're basically chain link fenced in areas in different parts of the range. 
And so if the, if the fences remain intact, it keeps the animals out. And so this gives us kind of a natural uh, laboratory to look at what would happen if animals can't get in and graze versus where they can. And so what you see here in white are our driving tracks. We drove, I forgot how many thousands of kilometers we drove while we were there. We were there for six weeks, sometimes two years. And uh, yeah, we drove about, I think, something like 18,000 <coughs> 18, kilometers. Yeah. And you, and you only had to look at the one of them. <laughs> and so the exposures. You can see the exposures here that are labeled according to their code numbers. And you can actually, you should actually be able to see the effect of the exposure because you can see our GPS track, the white track going around the edge of the exposure. And you can see in most cases inside the, the polygon, it's darker. And the reason for that is because the grass is longer. You know why the grass is longer. Longer grass casts more shadow, and so it appears darker. And so we, uh, we wanted to compare the inside versus the outside of the exposures. So the exposures, most of them are big enough that we can use the Landsat imagery. The pixels are small enough that we can actually take an average of pixel greenness time series inside an exposure and then in the surrounding areas outside. And, okay, so that's 2015, 16. On um, almost the same Julian day, only three days different. Uh, yeah, three days different, Julian day 278 versus 281, so effectively the same, same day of the year. And look at how much greener it is in 2016. These are clouds down here. So if we look at the inside versus the outside of the exposure, inside green, outside red, and 2015 across the top, 2016 across the bottom, you can Initially, you can see the difference. Uh, definitely greener, more vegetation inside than outside. And in some cases, in, in, in this exposure, it stayed greener on the inside throughout most of the year until everything was dried up. Uh, in this one, it, they, they both kind of dried up eventually. Here, same thing, eventually they come together. And so this shows us both at the end of the very end of the monsoon and then throughout the year, how much of a difference that fence makes. So the difference between the, in the red curve and the green curve is crazy. Because otherwise it's hard to get. Except for one thing, you might wonder, well, why would it be greener inside the fence right after the, I mean, shouldn't, they they get the same amount of rain? Shouldn't they start at the same greenness and then separate as the grazing goes on? The reason for that is it's standing grass, the standing vegetation, which you'll see a photograph in a second. The standing vegetation, when the cloud, the mists blow over the landscape, as soon as the, the mists touch something, water vapor, water droplets condense on it. And so standing grass basically acts as a, as a, as a capture device for water. This is how they do fog works. They hang nets, and the fog will condense onto the net and run down the net. And so the grass is basically acting as a, as a fog cars for you, and throwing more water out of the atmosphere into the soil. In fact, in some areas where the grass isn't as tall, we see a fence effect, where the water condensing onto the fences runs down. We see tall grass right on the inside of the fence, but not further, further into the fence. Yeah. Why would it be on the inside lower than on the outside? Yeah, several blocks or... Oh, well, when, when it gets down really low at the end? Yeah. Yeah, that's and the one above and the one that they are. You know, when it, when it gets down below about ten percent, you know, it's the, then things like atmospheric effects later in the year and dust and aerosol scattering start to impact. Oh, that's strange. It is strange. Yeah, I agree. I I, I blame atmospheric effects, but I don't have a good answer. So I don't know why that is, but yeah, I agree. It, it, it's odd. Um, but the, the lower the value, the less the less trust we have. Do you have an estimated distance with the fog bar between the projects? Do we have what's going on? The fog bar between. 
So they, they did have nets in some of these exposures. It looked like they were doing some kind of fog harvesting, but it looks like none of these exposures are maintained. And I'll show you photographs of some of these in just a second. But, but yeah, there was a, a, a research scientist, um, uh, named Franke Holderberg, who, who did some really interesting work on, on this effect. She called it horizontal precipitation uh, back in the 1990s. <laughs> And, um, and did field experiments and things and documented that this is happening. And so that's what we're kind of inferring that's what's, that's what's happening here. So now I'll, to close, I'll just show you, well, actually I'll show you, I have one more set of images to show you to close. But these are just photographs of some of these exposures and I don't have to tell you which side is the inside, which side is the outside. You can see the difference in the amount of grass there is on the ground. Uh, this is what happens when the camels can get their necks over the fence and start to pull it down. But you can see from the amount of grass on the inside, they didn't get completely in. They pulled it down and weren't completely successful. In some cases, they pulled the thing down entirely, or maybe the herders went wrong. And so some of these have been compromised. And all it takes is one hole, and then, you know, game over. Uh, this is looking through the fence. And so the foreground is inside. This is one of the ones that's further back in the range, and so it starts out drier. But you can see there's there's a silvery senesce grass inside, and then as soon as you cross the fence to the outside, it's just bare of earth. And this is a, this is a, the same effect, but in a case where uh, someone just built a stone wall, the stone wall was like waist high, so it was apparently high enough to keep the camels out and the cow. And so here you can, again you can see a big difference in the amount of grass. Okay, so you might imagine the logical thing to do would be to take these vegetation maps from the same time of the year, like what I was showing you, the flipping back and forth before, and just subtract them. Maybe we could use that as a way of identifying places where there have been big changes. And so that's what we did here. We took the vegetation map from the Landsat, and we subtracted one from 1987 from the one in 2016. And so any place you see a lighter shade of gray, that suggests that vegetation increased between 2016 and 1987. 1987, I think, was a wetter year, and so it should be comparable to 2016. And so lighter shades of gray suggest increases in the amount of vegetation. Darker areas suggest decreases. And what you see, in contrast to the bad news scenario, is that I see, I see a lot more lighter gray than darker gray, which suggests to me that at least between these two years, it increased. What's the baseline gray? Uh, the baseline's no change. But what's the baseline then? You're saying the lighter gray and the darker gray, and there has to be a baseline. Oh, sorry, uh, 20%. The maximum, the, the, the whitest area is a 20% increase in vegetation, fractional vegetation, and black areas, 20% decrease. And so there are big things like this. I don't know what this is. Well, I guess there must have been a farm here in some of these areas. These are cloud shadows. And now uh, we did, but then we did the same thing for 2015 versus 16, and you see big changes there too. And so that's that's just seasonal. That's not land, that much land cover change in one year. That's seasonal. And this is some amount of seasonal and some amount of real land cover change. One direction. Okay, now finally, the last bit. We have, if you, if you spend any time looking at Google Earth, you may wonder, well, why are you using 30 meter imagery? Why don't you just use the high resolution imagery like what we see in Google Earth? And we do, but the reason is you don't get complete coverage with that kind of high resolution. I mean, in cities you might, but here in the far you don't. And so we were lucky to find four, four scenes from 2002, 2003, 2016, 2017 that had some overlap. So we could look at some areas between those years, so basically 15 years separation. And so now I'll show you at the higher resolution, the point where you can see individual trees, uh, some of the changes that have occurred. So of course there's been development are building and expanding their, their homestead. And so here's March 2002, February 2017. 
You can see a big paved road came in. The brighter dirt roads disused, and so they're not as bright. You can see new homesteads, of course, individual trees. But what's interesting is you can see individual trees getting larger as they grow over the course of 15 years. You can see canopies of individual trees expanding as the tree grows. An example. And of course, in some cases, they're, they're smaller. This, this area here and here, um, they planted trees. But if you look over at this in the edge of the canyon here, you can see it's more closed out. You see more spaces between the trees in 2002 than in 2017. Similarly, in another canyon, 2002, 2017, what happened here. This must have been a flood, must have been a flash flood that came down the line and washed all those trees out. There must have been a big, in fact, we know from the 2003 image that it happened between 2002 and 2003. And here, another canyon and another, another wide open area is larger. The camel herders will take their camels up into the end of the canyons to browse, but camels don't tear down trees like that. They, this must have been, because it's in a drainage, it must have been a flash flood that came through and cleared it and then made it easier to move the animals. And so I think I've said everything on here already, so I won't bother, but sorry for going longer than expected. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>